My name is Karen Nelson. I'm a co-director at the Center for Literary and Comparative Studies here at the University of Maryland. It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you to the launch of Matt Kirschenbaum's, Matthew, Professor Matthew Kirschenbaum's most recent publication, Bitstreams. And we've been putting the discount code in the chat. So we'll continue to do that through the meeting. Um, the, the, this publication is coming out of the University of Pennsylvania Press, and they have graciously agreed to give a discount for orders um, made prior to October 31st. Um, I do want to acknowledge um, that every community owes its existence and strengths to the generations, but this this particular um, land acknowledgement comes from a book lab event. So every community owes its existence and strengths to the generations before them around the world who continue um, contributed to the making of the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to migrate to this land for hopes of a better life, and some have lived here for more generations than can be counted. Um, these things are critical in building a mutual respect and conversation across all barriers of heritage and difference um, to honor those who have been here before. Um, we need to acknowledge here at the University of Maryland, the traditional territory of the Mat Pun excuse me, Punavut, Patuxent, Piscataway, Mayon, and Pamuki peoples. Um, so to introduce Matthew Kirschenbaum could take days and we don't have time. So I'm gonna point to some of the key things that we one could say. Um, he's a professor of English at the University of Maryland. He's affiliated faculty at the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. He's teaching faculty at UVA's Rare Book School. He's a co-founder and co-director with Carrie Krause of the University of Maryland Book Lab. He has been long affiliated with the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities. Um, he's the director of the Digital Studies Certificate for the College of Arts and Humanities. He's won a Guggenheim. He's been a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow. Um, he has myriad publications. We've launched his track changes in 2016. His Zones of Control with Pat Harrington is also a 2016 publication. Um, his mechanisms, the uh, new media and the forensic imagination in 2008, I think probably um, he'll talk more about this, is um, part of, you know, helped him start the thinking for this Bitstreams project. Um, so I could go on and on, but I do want to at least say that the thing that I most appreciate and that this CV speaks to is the many ways he fosters intellectual community um, and sustains intellectual conversations across the department, across the university, and really across the world. Um, he's a huge um, public intellectual, in my estimation. He's done t a lot of outward facing writing. He does a lot of work on Twitter. He's just a, a, an amazing colleague, and I'm, I'm grateful we get to celebrate today. Um, he's joined today by, by Marissa Parham, who's also a sparkly person. She's directing the director for the African American Digital Humanities Project. She's an associate director for MYTH. Um, she's directing the Immersive Real, um, Realities Lab for the Humanities. Um, her CV too goes on and on. So I'm glad she's here. I'm glad Matt's here and I'm turning the conversation over to them. Thanks, Karen. Thank you for that. I'm looking at the time, so I'm just gonna get to it because <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion looking at us, looking at the book, looking at the audience. I feel like Karen, an introduction, I feel like you sparkled, like sort of like sprinkled glitter on all of us. So I really appreciate that. So just to get us started and even to get us some sense of sort of this context and what we're talking about and et cetera. Um, I was thinking, Matt, that would be helpful for you to say a little bit more, because I'm also just period, because sort of curious about this question myself. Mm -hmm. um, if you could just start us off um, navigating for us or telling us how you've navigated sort of moving between not print and digital, um, which we know, and I'm going to say this snarkily on purpose, because I'm going to come back to it, not, you know, writing articles and books versus like circulating PDFs, but really thinking about what it means, for instance, in you and Professor Krause's um, book lab, for instance, to work with the stuff of type, the matter of printing, the materiality of printing, um, and how that has sort of 
influenced either retroactively or answered the question the other way, the work you're doing around digital print heritage. And I have some passages in the book, of course, that I could turn to, but I was thinking of this question more into sort of a sense of journey. That's what I really get from your work, this sense of having moved from thing to thing. And in this moment, you're consolidating, right? So mm -hmm. can you say a bit about that? Yeah, thanks, Marissa. Um, let me just also start by just saying a couple of thank yous. Um, thanks so much to, to Karen and Tita for arranging this on uh, behalf of the English Department and the Center for Literary and Comparative Studies. Um, huge thanks, Marissa, for um, being my interlocutor this morning. There's nobody else who I there was no plan B, there was no second choice if you had said no thanks or I'm going to be in Toledo the, you know, that Wednesday. So I'm so glad you're able to hear, be here and do this with us. And huge, huge thanks to, um, to the folks at the University of Pennsylvania Press, um, particularly um, my editor there, Jerry Singerman, uh, who recently left the press but was a huge part of making this book and making it work. And just all of everybody who's here today. I'm just, this is kind of, I, I was saying before we've, we started, I've given a lot of public talks and I don't get rattled easily, but um, this is actually a little bit emotional to see. So just thanks so much to everyone for taking a little bit of their day to, to be here. Um, so to, to turn to the question, I mean, one of the coincidences of this book is that it, it came out this fall um, and I've been here at the University of Maryland for 20 years this fall. Um, and that marks a certain kind, it is a certain moment in one's you know, life, one's career. Um, and in that time, I, I've tried to always allow my interests to keep evolving. Um, I started in 2001, September 11th was my first semester here. And I started as the department's hire in what we were calling at the time digital studies. Uh, back in 2001, the English department wanted somebody to you know, look at all things digital. And um, so I, I came here to do that. And that's been a huge part of my intellectual life, but um, I've always been interested in other forms of textuality, other forms of media. And so when um, Carrie, when Carrie Krauss, my colleague, um, and I began thinking about Book Lab a few years ago, um, I never thought about it as a kind of departure from what I've been doing in the digital world. Um, I think very much about continuity between the print and the digital. So whether it's setting type, whether it's writing code, whether it's writing code, uh, these things are all of a piece. They're all on a continuum. Um, I think in particular with regard to bit streams, which I was writing and certainly finishing um, during the last three or four years as we were getting Book Lab up and running, you know, I think as you were getting at Marissa, Bitstreams itself is not a book exclusively about the digital. It's about the modulations, the flows, the transactions back and forth across different media. And maybe that's something we can talk a little bit more about. But that would be my starting point anyway for a kind of um, a response to your prompt. That was super helpful. Thank you. And I think it's interesting. I like this language of sort of flow and movement. Another thing you sort of, you know, highlight in the book, when I was asking this question to you initially, I was thinking about the work you're doing in Bitstreams, um, even with Kamal Brathwaite, right? And in that example, um, and just for people who haven't gotten the book yet or who have it, but they're really excited because right now it's on a soft pillow and they can't wait till they turn to it, you know, and et cetera. But in case people haven't turned yet to the reading, um, with the Brathwaite example, you do a nice job, I think, of bringing us to understand the numerous ways um, authors, in the case of Brathwaite, a Caribbean an author we might think of as post-colonial, et cetera, um, also turn to the digital as a different kind of opportunity. And that what's at stake in the different kind of opportunity of digital work is about the kinds of things that 
are done differently um, or have the capacity to be done differently outside of historical forms because the place of historical form is so much a previous place also of certain kinds of oppressions and calcifications, right? Yeah. But it was interesting because um, in your discussion of Brathwaite, you make this, I thought, you know, very sort of compelling point about, um, actually, I'm just gonna read for a brief moment, this is page 71. How would it change our reading of a poem if we had access to the complete menu of fonts in a computer from which Brathwaite had to choose? And if we then knew what he selected this one and not that one out of a finite set that we could survey. Um, and I found that really compelling because when we're thinking about archival work, um, manuscript archives, right? When we get to see the sort of like moment of drafting to bring typography into the world of the draft, the language of the draft, right? Mm -hmm. And to bring that, I think, really actively into also pursuing what I would argue is a sort of toolkit for writers under duress sometimes. So with that in mind, I was wondering if you could just say a bit more, because I think there's something important here as well that ties to the work you're doing in the CODA. Mm -hmm. If you could just say a bit more about opportunities in your experience, perhaps, of opportunities, I'm trying to be like too upbeat, but sort of opportunities for real transgression and mm -hmm. progression, but also the perils, it seems like you're also yeah. talking about, about engaging work in this way. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, Marissa, that's great. Um, right, so Brothwaite um, is in the book. Um, he is, um, he's somebody who participated in what in a fully westernized context we would describe as the so-called desktop publishing revolution of the mid 1980s. So this followed from the release of a very particular computer, the Apple Macintosh, and a couple of very particular accessories, including um, the Apple laser writer printer, uh, Adobe's PostScript language, all of these things that came together at a particular moment um, to really transform the way that books were designed, typeset, and ultimately published. Um, I suppose this also gets back to your initial question about Book Lab and how these things tie together. Um, but Brathwaite was an early adopter. He got a Macintosh and those accessories very early on. Um, fascinatingly, he's somebody who is not much discussed in at least one of the communities I participate in, the electronic literature community, because even though he worked so extensively with the computer and very sophisticated software, um, ultimately his work ended up in, in print. He published his work um, in printed format, um, and it only takes a moment of glancing through the work to see um, where it was coming from. I'm just opening to kind of random pages here, but maybe you can get a glimpse of all of these sort of um, old school Macintosh fonts that he was working with. Um, one of the things that really just kind of interested me about him um, was thinking a little bit more self-consciously about what both the computer and print as media afforded for that, um, for his particular project. And I think you're exactly right. For him, the computer was about certain kinds of opportunity. Um, writing in light was a phrase that he used over and over again to refer to what he was doing. I think there was a kind of aleatory quality to it, a fluidity to it, a kind of freedom that he found there. But by the same token, it was fascinating to me that he never published any work in digital form and in fact um, really struggled. He went through many different publishers. Um, the books were never quite to his satisfaction. They were never quite able to duplicate his vision. And ultimately, I think given his own particular situation, he still needed to, to rely on um, westernized channels of distribution, including the publishing industry, for certain kinds of cultural legitimacy and cultural access that were essential to him as well. So there is that modulation in his case between the print and the digital, most visible, most conspicuous, I think, around the typography that you mentioned, but really inflecting everything that he was doing with these two particular media forms. That last sentence really resonates me of thinking about the two media forms, right? Because I found myself even in my opening question, sort of resisting 
articulating a binary that I'm not convinced is always productive for us. Mm -hmm. Right. And your response really brought that back for me. So thank you. Yeah. And thinking also about, you know, um, oh, wait, pause, sidebar. Can I just encourage all the audience, um, but encourage the audience, um, feel free to start in the chat, ask questions, et cetera. It'll be super helpful um, if we start that process now. Otherwise, I imagine we'll just have a huge rush at the end of people all with a lot of questions and there'll be a lot to process. So please feel free to use that space and own that space. And hopefully Matt will forgive me, but I'm a huge fan of emojis because feedback is wonderful. Thank you. So <laughs> that said, um, I was thinking, no, <laughs> switch gears back to the very serious question of um, the sort of non-existent yet ultimately structuring print digital binary. Mm -hmm. um, and it's structuring because it reveals to us, um, of course, the numerous ways in which everything we think of as the dissemination of acts also has to require on all this apparatus, all yeah. these structures, all these institutions, right? And thinking about the ways in which, and I struggle with this a bit, so I'm sorry if it's convoluted because, you know, we know when we're talking about the digital, the ways in which everything can kind of be a metaphor for something else, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. at the same time, we're also talking about real things that happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I have materialities, I have, et cetera, right? Impacts, effects, affects, et cetera. Um, but given that, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about, from your perspective, what constitutes, um, what is working in the digital taught you or not taught you, <laughs> you know, might just feel differently yeah. about what constitutes loss in print. Because we so mm. often talk about what you lose when you move to digital. Yeah, and I was wondering in your experience what you might have to say about what it would mean to sort of reverse that paradigm. And again, mm. holding on, this is not a train. These are not train tracks, right? Um, this binary, but it's worth mm. saying it out loud, I think. Yeah. Let me, um, I'm going to um, see if I can actually share my screen for a moment, because I think this is a place where the, the visual will really help us. Um, bear with me as I as I do that. So what you're looking at here, um, and you might be able to, the, the least consequential thing, but it establishes context, the, the Dell logo off on the left-hand side of the image. Um, what you're actually looking at is a phone picture that I snapped of a computer screen. I'm sitting here in the reading room of the Firestone Library at Princeton University. And what I'm looking at on this Dell flat screen in front of me, and you'll see if you can of really squint and peer at the very center of the image. Um, this is a high resolution digital facsimile of the title page of one of the many typescripts that exist of Toni Morrison's many drafts for Beloved. And you can, again, just make that out in the very center of the image. Um, but of course, you can also see that this particular page is badly damaged. Uh, Toni Morrison had a house fire in the early 1990s. And that's what you're seeing the, the marks and traces of here. Um, so so at Princeton, where her papers now are, when you go to work with the collections there, um, largely because of the very uh, fragile, precarious state of so much of the manuscript material because of this fire, um, as a researcher, you are afforded no direct access to it. Everything is digital. Um, and so you sit in front of a dedicated workstation in the reading room. Um, there's, it's not networked. All of the ports have been disabled for security reasons, but then you can access high resolution images of every page of every document, every item that's in the collection. And I went there, um, I'll see if I can, uh, that was, very lucky. Um, so I went there really because of these artifacts that are in the collection. These are four floppy disks that also have digital um, versions, drafts of Beloved on them. And so in one sense, what we have is very much a kind of hybrid archive. Um, some of it born digital on the floppy disks, some of it um, in 
manuscript and typescript analog materials. But of course, the really fascinating thing for me once I got there and I kind of realized the nature of the experience I was going to have was that everything indeed was digital, whether regardless of its medium of origin, everything had now been subsumed by what I've called the bitstream. It's all the proverbial ones and zeros. Um, at the same time, on the other other hand, if you will, even though everything was now part of the bitstream, even though everything was now digital, um, there was still not equivalency between these bitstreams. Um, I wanted specifically to be able to compare the digital files to the high resolution images of the original manuscript and typescript to see if there were variants across them. And there's no good way to do that. Um, the images are digital images, again, high resolution JPEGs. Um, the material on the floppy disks, by contrast, is in legacy Word documents, word processing formats. And when you look at those, and again, what you're seeing here are my camera phone photos, but now what you're seeing is one of those born digital files from the floppies juxtaposed with the high resolution image facsimile image of the typescript, um, the same portion of the book, this is the famous final page, um, the, the ending of Beloved. Um, and so the, what the lesson that I kind of took away from here is that for a scholar to work with the, what Jerome again, one of my mentors would have called the textual condition um, of this particular novel. Um, one has to move not only from print to digital, but across different manifestations, different incarnations of the bitstream that are themselves incommensurate with one another. The only way I could finally do those comparisons was manually by eyeballing them, if you will. There was no computational or automated or algorithmic way to read across those old legacy Word documents and compare them to what was in these JPEG images. And that sort of of, um, realization. So just to kind of conclude this um, story, which really is the kind of um, story that organizes the first chapter of the book, um, Archives Without Dust is what I called the chapter. Um, there are some minor variants in the digital files. The digital files do represent this famous uh, final page of the book in states that are not otherwise represented in the manuscript collection. Um, but more than that, and I, you know, I, I do the, 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 the work of documenting that in the chapter, but more than that, the realization that the bitstream is not self-identical, the ones and zeros mean things in different contexts and they operate differently in different contexts. That was kind of the key takeaway from that experience. And so your question about loss, um, this isn't the best image, um, I think, to really show it, but if you can make out um, towards the bottom of the digital um, file here, there's gibberish. Um, there's material that, um, so we have ASCII text that's legible at the, the top portion, but then there's um, encoded gibberish, for want of a better word, glyphs, ciphers um, at the end. And that too is a certain kind of loss, looking at these partially legible but partially corrupted digital files alongside of those amazing and frightening images of the fire damaged original typescript. Um, that was really powerful and you know, I think kind of formative for my thinking in, about the project. Thank you for that. It's funny because like for this entire event, I'm so overwhelmed with the sense of this is a celebration, but I'm also like, but tell me more about the loss. Because mm -hmm. of course, you know, this is almost going back to the metaphor. I mean, it's funny thinking about the sort of, you know, corrupt attacks, um, the leakage at the mm -hmm. end of the document you're showing us. Um, mm -hmm. 
the manuscript document you were leakage is a great term a great word I mean, that's how you read it because it's yeah. almost yeah. like the thing got stored in the wrong place with word we yeah. actually see how the package didn't compile properly for that um and can't be recovered mm -hmm. right and so i was wondering though in thinking about this mm, two things nope i'll say one thing because two things is too much um but one thing i'm thinking about with this is thinking about the sort of i don't for my own work in manuscript archives and working especially with digital files i've been thinking a lot lately about how carefully writers and all kinds of artists and thinkers etc um, if they have the opportunity, somewhat control their archive. Morrison's famous for this, right? There's also a profound sense of high level control for the archive. Yeah. Um, but that can be different from other authors, for instance, as we know, or other writers and artists who, for instance, you know, die unexpectedly, you know, et cetera, and haven't had the time mm -hmm. to sort of comprise the archive in that way. And mm -hmm. the reason why I'm thinking about this in relation to the text you were showing is I was also thinking about how on the one hand, and this is embedded in some of what you're saying earlier, the digital gives us a sense of control, the sense of presentation. Um, even as in your book, as you properly point out, we lose a sense of control very often across devices. So, you know, I design a thing for a desktop, it gets read on the phone, right? There's even a baseline that's give you a super duper basic version of this. But I was also thinking how there's something analogous and important in this. I can't quite pull it together. So I'm gonna ask you to pull it together um, in thinking about this in relation to the numerous ways that I imagine creators don't necessarily even understand how to control a digital archive. I can't think of anything more terrifying Wait, we can make the argument as you do in certain ways that in order to be able to even properly preserve the argument, I'm sorry, to be able to properly preserve any given digital text, yeah. right? That you also need the machine. I can't think of anything more horrible than someone getting my whole ass laptop. Sorry, to be blunt. You see what I'm getting at, right? Mm -hmm. And so what yeah. would constitute my archive includes a device that is far more multivarious, far more personal than we usually think of. I mean, <laughs> manuscripts are personal, but hopefully you yeah, see the distinction yeah, yeah. I'm making here. So can yeah. you offer some ways just to kind of think about this and what's at stake in this for us, even as researchers maybe, or as creators, like, is this like a, if I die, press this button, delete mm -hmm. or what? You see what I'm getting at, I'm being a little silly, but hopefully my point is yeah. clear. No, I think so. Um, I mean, I think that actually sort of dovetails a little bit with still another story, which is in the book. Um, and this is the the poet who um, who's, work and life and career I sort of narrate as a kind of, in a kind of contrapuntal way to Brathwaite's in the second chapter, uh, William Dickey, um, who um, is not exactly a household name, but um, was very much a, um, a well-established poet in the second half of the 20th century. Um, won the Yale Younger Poets Prize and I think it was 1959. Uh, one of his competitors that year was uh, somebody named Sylvia Plath um, and went on to have a successful writing and teaching career in poetry. Um, but towards the end of his life, so he lived his most of his entire life and most of his life in San Francisco. Um, and um, he, he died very much prematurely. Um, he died of complications from uh, the HIV virus, um, which he contracted. Um, and towards the end of his life, before his death in 1994, um, he had been experimenting with digital poetry, using as it happens, and this is why I tell their stories in tandem, the exact same type of computer as Brathwaite, and they were both doing it at exactly the same time, even though to the best of my knowledge, um, they, they did not meet each other, correspond, or really um, have any other sort of um, awareness of one another. But um, Dickey's work um, was not published in his own lifetime. His digital poetry was not published um, in his lifetime. Um, it was supposed to be, and in fact, there's another sort of really interesting textual moment. Um, if you look at the author's note at the conclusion of his last volume of poetry, um, it, um, it references as um, something that's already happened, the publication of the digital poetry, but it never, it never did. And so um, the poetry only survived on a handful of floppy disks 
which by way of another writer named Dina Larson in the community eventually made their way here to the collections at Maryland. And out of a lot of serendipity and with the expertise of some other people, I was able to recover the poetry from those diskettes and not so long ago, make the poetry available at the internet archive. Let me see if I can uh, just dump that URL into the, the chat. So this was work that was originally done in a now obsolesced format known as HyperCard. And I put, just put the link in the chat. And this becomes a story about serendipity, contingency, fragility. Um, Dickey, um, as an establishment poet, had, I think, a certain kind of freedom and latitude that Brathwaite did not. Um, he was able to, I think, be more experimental in his aspirations for the work. Um, but there was also a risk to that in that um, the poetry for some 30 years after or 25 years after his death um, was not in circulation and has not formed part of his literary legacy. So, um, you know, I see Judy Malloy is in the audience. She's somebody else from this particular community of writers. Hi, Judy. Um, you know, I know this is something she's, she has thought a great deal about um, what individuals can do to preserve their own digital legacies and the kind of fragility that that's always going to have archival institutions notwithstanding. There's something really, I'm trying not to be too sort of personal and moved by that. It was fun to be moved, I know. But, you know, as someone myself who mainly produces now only born digital work, I remember mm -hmm. when I first started doing this work years ago, the first thing a former colleague said to me is like, well, I guess you're, you know, you've always been strange. And I can see now that you've really become comfortable with just remaining obscure for the rest of your life. And it was an interesting take because they were right on some level um, because, and they were getting at the question of even legacy. Yeah. Right, what lasts into the future, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing to think about there, and I actually don't think, by the way, they're absolutely right by any means, but there's a knee-jerk sort of response there around the ephemerality and fragility of archives um, that you're speaking of, Matt, that I think also translates in, you know, often, often in fortunate ways. Um, you know, a lot of my work is around how to make sure that people who do such work can be institutionally recognized, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of the complexity in this. But I was also thinking how some of this as well is about transforming reading practices. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I know when I'm teaching, I'm sure a lot of us in this audience have these moments when you're teaching digital tax, you have to also introduce a whole series of methods and tools that make that possible. Because of course the students can read and enjoy and et cetera, but how do they cite? How do they archive? How do they show? How do they quote? Mm -hmm. um, it becomes really complex. And so I was wondering if you could say just a bit about what you've been thinking about in relation to the question of, you know, the tools of reading. And the tools of reading can include, mm -hmm. um, anything cognitive you're thinking of, like just reading differently, but I'm also just thinking about the material, like what's the stuff you need? And it feels unsatisfactory, but at some point you're in class and you're kind of like, well, you really got to get good at screenshotting. And it feels like, you know, a not very robust response, but it has yeah. to be in the toolkit. So if you could run with that a little bit um, as well, I think it'd be really interesting. And part of a subset, I should say, this question is a subset of something I saw in the chat, which is um, a question from Caleb Weinbrenner thinking about maps. And I'm thinking there's something there in thinking about this question goes to how would you apply the modulation of bit streams to non-written, non-linguistic media for the humanity? So I know I piled a lot in there. This yeah. is about tools and teaching and how to read, but also the ways in which even written text in a bit stream text is still in some, where a digital text is in many ways also going to be a visual oral text in a new way. And if you can yeah. say more about that. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll try. I mean, I think the word that's coming to mind straight away for me is a certain kind of agency with regard to the bitch stream. And this is already, I mean, the question is already kind of making me think about maybe what is one of the blind spots in the book, which is that in my sort of narratives, you know, these stories I tell about actors like Dickey and Brathwaite and Tony Morrison, um, and then my sort of encounter with their legacy bit streams. The bit stream is something that's kind of out there and you've got to kind of tussle with it and kind of, you know, wrangle it and kind of, um, you know, find a way to operationalize it in a manner that is, um, you know, 
that that's productive and, and workable. This is very much the day-to-day -day practical work of what archivists increasingly do as more and more cultural heritage. And this is where heritage comes into the title of the of my book as well, um, as more and more cultural heritage is born digital. Now, again, on the one hand, we're back to that proverbial bitstream, the ones and zeros, but those themselves are inherently meaningless. They only assume meaning when they're contextualized by way of other forms of computational apparatus, which we in our day to day would call software. So all of that is sort of, I think, present in my narrative in the book. But what isn't there quite as much is this sort of notion of what you're describing and these different kinds of agency that become sort of learned ways of encountering the bitstream. So, um, you know, you mentioned screenshotting, which is, you know, something that, you know, I think a lot of us, you know, kind of do it, you know, in a kind of um, second nature kind of way now as part of our own day-to-day -day practice, something, you know, that we want to save for our personal notes and archives, something that we want to document, something that we want to share. Um, but, all of these are sort of learned behaviors and they are forms of literacy. Um, and the way in which we can, you know, use a feature like share screen on Zoom and I can take you to my desktop and go into my research photos from my trip up to Princeton four, five years ago, right? And kind of put those up on the screen and then toggle back and forth. All of those are learned behaviors. None of them should be naturalized. And they're ultimately forms of reading as well. And so they're forms of reading and, you know, as I like the word I often come back to is torque. So they're forms of reading and they're forms of torquing the bitstream to kind of bend it, twist it, manipulate it in a way um, such that all of that data flow becomes useful and, and legible. Um, I think just obviously within the last year and a half because of the pandemic um, and our day-to-day -day habitus in spaces like this, um, we've learned new ways, each of us for ourselves, of engaging the bitstream and exerting agency over it. Um, new reading tools, new reading strategies in the ways that you're suggesting. Thank you for that pivot to literacy. That's super helpful. Um, I'm also watching the chats over talking. So let's start integrating Q&A as well into mm -hmm. this conversation a little bit more. And just sidebar, I want to say, you know, for me, and thank you, Tita, for pointing it out, um, a lot of my work has been in the Octavia Butler archive. I was really fortunate. I actually got to be the first sort of like non-archivist hands to be on it. So I was you know, very honored by that. But I have to say, working in that archive kind of broke me um, as a researcher. Um, and I've been interested having worked with that and the Morrison archives and the differences between them. Precisely, you know, the sentence that sort of came to mind as you we were talking, Matt, um, both as a level for us, all of us as being, you know, quote, digital citizens who live in this world, sort of torque or be torqued. Um, and I guess it's a little bit to the Butler Morrison difference. I won't belabor it here. It's a different event because Butler's, when I say broke me, I just mean it's filled with things that I would completely be willing to bet money on she would not have wanted mm -hmm. um, to ultimately mm -hmm. have been collected in that archive. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. she's someone else, example I gave who died suddenly, yeah. right? Um, and the archive is a beautiful job and respect all the things, but it's hard. Mm -hmm. um to think about sometimes right it's, it's very very intimate and the digital gives us a way of thinking about um and i want to exaggerate the point because i think there's so much to do in sort of like even the material archaeology of manuscript work as you know with paper mm -hmm. but with the digital again the ways in which even this goes to your point even in which the ways the ways in which the multiple approaches how one chooses to read will be so deterministic and there's actually so much more material to work with mm -hmm. in a way right and there's something you know again to think about with this about what it means for us to have to all become more sort of self-conscious i'm thinking of the work even of groups like you know doc doc now document the now burgess and um jules and also with um ed summers and thinking about social media 
torque or be torqued, right? And to work around political archives. Because when you start archiving social media, that also becomes a locus of state control or is revealed as a locus of state control. At the same time, if you're looking mainly at marginalized communities, social media becomes a place of so much digital participation and creation and art in ways that we have to take very seriously. So I was wondering if you have um, any thoughts given that in thinking about sort of not just literacy, but even what's at stake in this new literacy mm. moving forward and how we perhaps think about this also as a practice, not just for readers, but also for writers, not just mm -hmm. for consumers, but also for makers mm -hmm. um, and how we think about that even relation. Um, actually, I'll stop there because I'm about mm -hmm. to keep going and I'm trying to keep up with the questions as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think so. I mean, I, um, I'm real, I, I always feel more comfortable talking about writers than I do readers for whatever reason. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be on this particular terrain. Um, so one of the ways of thinking about my book, Bitch Dreams, is that I, it is, um, in as much as it's a book about the digital, um, it's also, or at least I would hope it is received and read as a book that's about bibliography. Um, bibliography is a word that um, is, is often uncomfortable to, to many of us, certainly for my students, because they associate it with long, tedious lists of books that they have to put together at the end of a research paper. But the word itself, bibliography, is literally writing about books. And it names a venerable scholarly discipline um, devoted to the study and analysis, not only of books, but to all forms of written and scripted objects. Um, and so thinking about what this means in relation to the bitch stream, um, one of the sort of sacred tenets of bibliography is the individuality of all things. Um, every instance, every copy is unique. Um, even when at first glance, superficially, they appear identical. You know, people have been sharing their photos of bitch dreams and, you know, they all have the same cover, you know, looks like the same book. We can be confident that Judy's page 79 is the same as Amanda's page 79 and so forth. But um, the reality is that history and indeed bibliography teaches us otherwise. Um, one of the things that I noticed about um, bitch streams when my copies arrived um, is that they in fact are all print on demand copies which is something that many university presses, including clearly the University of Pennsylvania Press, are moving towards more and more these days. So the giveaway here, the clue, is on the very last page of the book where you'll see a funny little code. Um, and there's a URL to something called ICG. Um, and there's um, consumer product safety information. And then there's a, a very cryptic um, numeric and alphabetic code um, that if you know how to decipher it, will tell you the date on which this copy was printed and the location where it was printed. So I happen to know that this particular copy of Bitch Dreams was printed on September 13th, 2021, um, about two weeks before it thumped on my own doorstep in a box um, from the press. Um, it was printed on September 13th, 2021 in Jackson, Tennessee, um, where there's a, a plant that, um, an ICG plant that does print on demand uh, publishing uh, for many clients, the University of Pennsylvania Press among them. And so, you know, I'm dwelling on this because ultimately what Bitch Streams is, I think, um, is a digital entity, a digital asset that sometimes on demand, as it were, assumes a kind of secondary material form as a printed object. Um, and one of the implications of that, and this I think will not be much of an issue for bitch streams, but it could be an issue for other different kinds of books that are published now in this way, is that there will be no real way to ensure that all copies are 
identical. Um, the digital files that constitute the book um, can be changed at any point. If I discover errata or you know, typos, um, these can be updated. And this, of course, isn't new. I mean, this is, again, the loop back to Book Lab and early print history, where this was very much the normative uh, textual condition for early printing. But there's a sense in which it's coming back around once again. And that kind of inherent instability um, is something that I think perhaps paradoxically, we're going to see more of, not less of, um, not only with the digital, but more specifically with services like print on demand, um, other forms of uh, just in time, as it's referred to, uh, just in time printing and manufacturing. Thank you for that. There's something so striking in thinking about mm -hmm. the idea even of on demand. It's mm -hmm. its own sort of heuristic yeah. for what- And about that word about. demand, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It encapsulates a lot and quickly because I'm tying this, I'm gonna say also to the chat, trying to resist metaphors, but can't because what you're getting at, of course, is, and this is being a little bit cliche written, but looking at the time, um, but thinking about, you know, sort of the book as a sort of stable, imagining the book as a stabilized body in the past, which is now that's gone, right? It's iterative. Mm -hmm. But thinking alongside, I'm thinking about Claudia Rankin, for instance, yeah, and absolutely. thinking alongside, right, the idea of, you know, at every X printing, the names of people killed in yeah. police brutality of Black people explicitly so, um, killed in instance changes over time. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, just, I mean, this is fascinating because um, that's actually, I mean, that's a, such a, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's 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 an incredibly intense, I would say, example of the phenomenon. Um, Citizen is not print on demand, um, but it is nonetheless a product of current technologies and strategies in the publishing industry, where even before print on demand, print runs could be, were ever smaller in size owing to digital printing. Um, and so because the book um, continues to sell so well, um, there's ongoing demand for it. There are new printings that continually need to be published. And in ways, again, that are very intense and very moving, um, Claudia Rankine has been able to kind of leverage that particular twist or torque of the supply chain in order to stage these interventions into and into memory really is what I would say by continually revising and updating uh, that particular page each time the book is um, printed anew. Absolutely. And I think what I was getting at exactly that and thinking yeah. about, again, trying to resist a metaphor, but thinking so much about what it means, therefore, to be able to use the technology to reverse the flow of the demand. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Resituating where the demand, the site from which the demand emanates. Right, yes. and for her, yes. I'm looking at the questions or looking at some of the comments in the chat and thinking about what I'm hearing, Catherine um, and Kathy, is a question of where's the locus control and from where does it emanate and how do we read it, right? As itself, mm -hmm. even a subset of archival materials, the control mm -hmm. itself becomes a site of the archival, but also thinking, um, it's Catherine Harris's question from 1242, it helps at the timestamp higher up mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. thinking about um, preserving artwork I'm going to read it briefly, um, but on preserving and archiving artwork into VR platforms in order to save things like Japanese American internment houses or murals are in danger of being painted over. Mm -hmm. And just thinking about the ways in which the digital becomes a place through which we can continually, and you talk about this very beautifully in the first chapter of your book, Matt, um, can also be parlayed as a way of constantly sort of deciphering and ciphering and archiving memory. Mm -hmm. Right, which becomes the site of the individual, going to on demand, the individual mm -hmm. um, becomes the site of demand in this paradigm. But I was also wondering um, if we could think more, say more, and again, looking at the chat about mm, what's changed, right? I mean, I just like there's a kind of baseline question of like, what really, if we're thinking long term, um, 
can change, what we want from the change. You know, I'm always going to say, like, ultimately, how do we actually begin thinking about this as mm-hmm. a site of transformation mm-hmm. over which we want or have been granted, not have been granted, that we want or can seize control? And yeah. thinking about what are the possibilities for the very idea of literature and literary mm-hmm. production that yeah. can be cited in this transformation that you're speaking of? Mm-hmm. I mean, sure. Um, I mean, I can try to do a little bit with that. Um, I mean, it brings me to one of the um, other exemplars um, that I talk about in the book. This is chapter three, the, the, story, the story of S. And the S, the capital letter S, um, some of you will, will know this particular book, um, which bears both, this is a um, black letter type uh, capital S on the slipcase. And then um, there's this particular book, The, the Ship of Theseus. Um, this um, assemblage um, is the product of um, a creative team that was assembled by J.J. Abrams. Yes, that J.J. Abrams, um, working with a novelist named Doug Dorst, um, as well as a small design company called Melcher Media. They're based in New York City. Um, and what S and various other Melcher productions as well, I think, attempt. Um, Many of them work in a modality um, that we would um, academically call transmedia. They tell stories across different media. Um, So S is a book um, that also, when you open it, trying to give people a little bit of a sense without, um, you can see things are literally slipping and sliding. There are those uh, sibilant sounds, right, out of my copy of S, but it's filled, S is filled with inserts. Um, and so um, all of these different media objects, which also extend to the, the digital world. Um, so S was published back in 2013, and within about a year of its publication, alternate endings, alternate versions of its final chapter were in circulation online. And nobody really knew if that was fan-generated material, if it was coming either directly or indirectly from Abrams and Dorst and the original creative team, some combination thereof. And what you find when you kind of delve into like the 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 rabbit holes um, that readers of S have opened up, and you go into their forums and discussion groups online. You, we come back to that word I mentioned a few minutes ago: a bibliography. You have people looking at things like typefaces and paper stocks, and trying to sort of adjudicate um, competing versions and variants of all of these different texts. And these are not academics who are doing this. These are readers, more specifically, these are fans. And this is something I really only kind of touch on in the book, but there's something about the kind of dedication, um, the rigor, the intensity of fandom and fan communities that I think speaks to some of these same practices, um, including the bibliographical appreciation for the kind of, fundamental uniqueness of all entities um, that are in the world, every instance, every copy, and being able to kind of map relations between them and make meaning in that way, right? That's what these reader communities, these fan communities are doing all the time. Um, You see it, I think, in really pronounced ways with these so-called transmedia works, Um, but you also, I mean, whatever, you know, you know, you know, Squid Game or whatever the TV show of the moment is, right? You can see it in the same kind of intensity that fan discussions will uh, cultivate around seemingly the smallest details of whatever the work is. There's something really hilarious, Matt, because you did earlier make a point that you prefer to talk about writers, but here mm. we are with the readers. We're because, back to the readers. Right? And I'm thinking about, you know, I see you're here, I'm looking at, I'm thinking of Anastasia Salter's work, others Mm. work, for instance, on fandom, because Mm -hmm. there's something really critical in this as well about conceptualizing the digital or Mm -hmm. digital texts 
um, or digitized text. We could go all day with this, but organizing them or thinking about them as sites of participation. And we can make the argument, of course, books have always been sites of participation, but what does it mean to amplify that? Yeah. And what does it mean to, in fact, push this um, to a new place as well? I'm looking at sort of, you know, there's some questions in the chat and sort of thinking about what's next. I think I'm gonna frame it a little bit differently and simply say, um, I'm curious to know, um, because this is about a book, obviously, and a book is a specific kind of moment, right? Yeah. Or any kind of moment of textual production is about a kind of moment yeah. um, that's special to the writer. And I guess my question for you is simply, um, in your world of worlds, what would the book have done next? What would have been the next move? What's the thing you couldn't get to? Or what's the thing, mm -hmm. even after writing, you realize, oof, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't know what the, the next big thing is. Um, there. So, I mean, speaking of S, just within the last week or two, it seems to have gone out of print and copies um, are suddenly now, um, the, the, there, are, there are copies going for hundreds and hundreds of dollars now on eBay. Um, that's one sort of um, hazard of working with material that's so contemporary is even when you think you're done with it, it never quite lets go of you. Um, but, um, you know, I think, yeah, as you say, Marissa, this book is a product of a certain moment. It originated as the 2016 Rosenbach lectures at the University of Pennsylvania. It's the kind of thing one is asked to do if they're very fortunate at a certain moment in a career. So it's synthetic in that way. Um, it's it's it's. I found it a. It, it, it was even it, it was it's it's not an easy exercise to on the one hand be synthetic and meet expectations that way, but then also to break new ground and meet expectations in that way. Um, so I this is a it's my third book. It feels to me very much like a third book, doing the kind of scholarly work that third books often do. I don't know the shape that the fourth book is going to take just yet, um, but I do, I'm very confident it will be informed by my um, things that I'm currently doing in book lab for, for one thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's super excellent. Um, oof, we can keep going and going. There's just too much to talk about. Um, because my question goes not only to book, but also to the question of just the questions, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm also looking, oh, time is cruel. Time is like 1259 looking right <laughs> back at me. Um, so my guess is we're going to wrap it up here, but Karen Artita mm -hmm. can tell me otherwise, because I will not stop, but I know I have to stop. I have to go to my can't, own class. But <laughs> can't, can't, can't stop, won't stop. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe we can all unmute and applaud oh. um, Marissa for her gorgeous interlocutor roles and questions and propositions, and Matt for the third oh. book. And I can't believe you said fourth book. You gave me a little hard time. <laughs> all right, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And Thank please you. share on Twitter and social media and in life and buy the book. Yes. And Matt, you get the last word. Yeah, no, the, the last word is simply thank you. I, this, this means so much. It really does. Thank you. And that's all I'm going to trust myself to say. <laughs>